All right, we are in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, we will be talking about relationships. Relationships. Colossians, sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, there, <laughs> Colossians 3. Colossians 3. I, I have a surprise for you, so I'm kind of like, I got so many things in my head. I, I'm going to wait for the surprise. You're going to love it. Okay. Colossians 3. Relationships, starting in verse 18. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with that as right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Relationships are all around us. We live in a world of them. Our lives are filled with them in such a degree that God has created us to live this way. Genesis chapter 2 God says this, then God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the name called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep Sleep, And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, and then he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Genesis, the Bible, is very clear that God has intended us to enjoy relationships, to be a part of them. And that while we live on this earth, there will be some form of relationship that we will have with another person. And to such a degree, I think it's interesting that we even name inanimate objects, boats and cars, things that we have value. We give them name and significance by trying to personify them in a type of relationship. It's really kind of interesting. What kind of hit home to me is um, this idea of relationships and how they're kind of woven inside, kind of in the context of us as people. It just naturally pours out of this. And I want to give you an example here. Uh, I'll be right back. We had our last child. So he's, um, how old is he? He's six. Six years old. That's right. Six. So my wife was like, hey, we should have another child. And I said, that's a crazy idea. And so what she did is she found a dog. And so dogs have this unique way. Here, come here. Come here, come here. This dogs have this unique way of, uh, one, just wanting attention and love and affection. And what I notice about our dog, it's our dog Phoebe, is that she, um, every night, will come up and jump on my bed, and she'll try to play bite me if if she's, because she's mad at you. And she's mad at you because you didn't play with her long enough in the day, or what she feels is long enough. You don't do those type of things. And so Phoebe is this kind of great example of how, you know, in relationship, oh, she's looking, she's like, hmm, somebody looks nice out there. Here, lay down, lay down, here. And what I know about Phoebe is what she'll do is she, I'll be in my office and she'll literally take her hand, her head, and push my hand off. I don't know if you need dog lovers. And she won't leave me alone until I do something, until I pet her. Right? And so she's, she's a little nervous. But what, I was, what she would do, like I was just in my office with her a minute ago. She sits right behind my chair and just proximity. She just wants to be close. And I find that really kind of fascinating. Here's, here's a dog, right, which are superior to cats. Um, Here's a dog. (laughs) They make good movies about dogs. They don't make good movies about cats. Garfield is a narcissist, just to let you know. But Air Buds is a good movie about a good dog who saves the world. So, but dogs have this incredible way of just speaking to a level of humanity. See, she just wants to be loved. 
And it's just funny how we kind of personify that and we talk about it. Here, do you want to see a trick? Do we have a trick? Can we do a trick with her? All right. I don't know if she was. No, she's rolling. All right, Come you're on. good, Phoebe. Go. All right, go with mom. Go with mom. Let's go. Let's go. Wow. Only if she would do that during the daytime, it'd be a lot better. But what I show you is that even in a practical way, we as humans are always interested in connecting with things. So there's, and I know in St. Pete in particular, there's just this boom of people that owning animals. In some way, animals have this level of relationship. Nice thing is they don't talk back or sassy with you. Uh, they will chew your clothes and things like that. But we personify them with these characteristics of, of a person. And, and, the, the, and I think this is interesting because I think it speaks to this greater thread that we all desire relationships, that we're all looking to be a part of relationships and that relationships are a part of us if we like it or not. We can't, we can't run from it. We can't separate ourselves from that. Relationships shape our world. We're bond to relationships. They shape us. They, relationships give us context also of the world. They give us an ability to understand um, not only uh, what, uh, how we view things or people or, or, or just in so many ways, they give us context to how we live. And so when it comes to relationship, what Paul teaches here is the ethic of Christian relationships. Look at what he says here in the text here about these relationships. And there's something unique about them. The relationships are reciprocal, which means that both parties are required to participate to make them work. Look at what he says. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. They both have a part in this relationship. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not embitter your children. They both have a responsibility in the relationship. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Verse 24, our 20, um, masters, chapter four, verse one, provide your slaves with what is right and fair. The idea here is that there is, in Christian relationships, a requirement on both parts to function in these relationships. Now, here's where it gets incredibly messy. When one party chooses not to participate in a relationship, what ends up happening? It gets messy really quick. Not only does it get messy really quick, there becomes problems and frustration to such a degree that you go to great lengths to avoid any proximity or closeness to that person or thing. It brings too much pain. It brings too much discomfort. It brings too much sadness. The, the idea is that relationships, while we are wired for them, while we are meant to be a part of them, can also be an incredibly, incredibly heavy burden. It can be, it could fracture us when we're a child. It can distort our reality of what's true and what's not. I mean, relationships have a way and have a power over us because we're made for them. You know, Martin Luther was a great reformer. Martin Luther wanted to change the church and change its practices. Luther um, Barclay, in his commentary, writes this about Luther's experience with his father. Luther's father was so stern to him that Luther, all his days, found it difficult to pray these words, Our Father. The word father in his mind stood for nothing but severity. The duty of the parent is always discipline, but it's also encouragement. Luther himself said, spare the rod and spoil the child, it is true. But beside the rod, keep an apple to give him when he does well. Luther, this great intellect, this great man, led this, in a way, reform of the church, struggled to pray to God and use the word our father because of a relationship that he had with his earthly father. His earthly father, because of his severity, Luther could not see God in a different way that he wasn't severe because all he could picture and imagine is the relationship that he had in front of him. So what I'm saying is that relationships have incredible power 
to shape us in the present. They can do a lot of damage. And here's the thing, what it says here, relationships, Paul talks about even our relationships with each other. He tells us to put to death earlier in chapter three in verse five, what belongs to our earthly nature. So he talks either about sexual impurity in verse five, but then he also talks about the distortion of anger. How when we lie to each other and we don't practice the truth and we allow the words to come out of our mouth that produce what it here is, uh, what he uses the word here, filthy language from your lips. In the context of a relationship, that can do a lot of damage. It can do a lot of damage. So how are we to live, as Paul is saying here, in a Christian relationship? What we notice here, that what Paul does, not only does he speak about a relationship requires two parties to come together, that they're meant to both work together in it, but what Paul does is says this, that a Christian relationship is not just between a husband and wife, a father or a child, it's not just between an employer and employee. He goes, there's a third wheel in that relationship. And he mentions it in every context of relationships. Look at what he says here. Wives, submit yourself to your husband. So there's the relationship in marriage, husband and wife, as is fitting in the Lord. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Paul says, let me tell you, there's a third character, a third person that's a part of your relationship. Children, obey your parents in every thing, for this pleases whom? You would think the reciprocal would be the father, but who does he say it pleases? This third character in the relationship, the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for who? Your master? No, for the Lord. And what you notice here in these relationships, the Christian view of relationships, not only do I have a part, but there's another person part of that relationship. It is the Lord. When it comes to this idea, though, of the Lord, who is the Lord? In the Old Testament, they would, God, um, in Genesis 1, it would say, in the beginning, Elohim, that's the title for God. Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The thing about the word Elohim, it, it's a generic word, and it's just a title. However, in Genesis chapter 2, Elohim has a name. His name is Yahweh. When you see it in the Old Trans T Testament translated, though, you see it is translated as Lord, all capital letters. What Paul is doing is saying, let me tell you that in your relationship as a husband and wife, God is personally part of that. It's his personal name. When you see the word Lord in the New Testament, it's a reference to God as Yahweh. Now, it also can mean a human master, which it uses that context in verse um, 24, I believe. But it's meant to bring us back to his name. What is his name? I am that I am. So this idea here of what Paul is saying is that in Christianity, in Christianity, your relationship has this part of it that makes you both have the ability and the power through the Holy Spirit to have the relationship together. And without it, you cannot fulfill what it's saying. You can't. It's impossible. You know, I was um, earlier this week, in, uh, I was in the office and uh, one of the, uh, somebody who was a volunteer was in, I don't see them right now so I can say it, okay. So a volunteer was in and they're like, whatever you do, don't talk about verse 18. I'm like, verse 18? Wives, submit to your husband. And so what happened to us, I thought it was really curious to me when I heard that. I was like, yeah, no, I understand how husbands, when they use that word in context, 
think that they abuse that context. And what happens is it becomes a personal thing between the husband and the wife. And I think what's happening here is maybe he doesn't understand the context that God is a part of that relationship. The, the, okay, let's just work through each one of them. How is God and how is the power of God give us the ability to both function as a husband and a wife? Wives, submit yourself to your husbands in verse 18 as is fitting in the Lord. Then he says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. In the book of Ephesians, there's a verse that comes before this whole set of verses about relationships. And I think it's fitting to put it in here. It says this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then in the book of Ephesians, he lists these three types of relationships. The same thing he does in Colossians. But that verse is kind of important. Submit to one another. What is Paul talking about when he talks about this idea of submitting to one another? What he's saying and speaking about is that when God made male and he made female, he made them both in his image. The male is not only in the image of God and the female is not. They both are in his image. He both calls them human. They are mankind. And he's just said not the, the man is not the, just the male, uh, the human and the woman is not. They both are created by him. And their growth both created for each other. In the context of that relationship, they have different roles but they both have value and are created equal in his sight. One's not greater than the other. With that context, he says, as humans, will you submit to one another? And in your submitting to one another, who are you submitting to? God himself. When you act as a human, the way you were designed to live, and you submit to one another, you are fulfilling part of your design to live in relationship. That, that, that verse is the key to all the rest of them. So when he says here, submitting, his wives submit yourself to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. He speaks about this third character in this relationship, the husband, the wife, in the Lord. And he says, when you submit, this is fitting in the Lord. Saying, when you submit, realize, wife, your significance doesn't come from his love, but it comes from me, the Lord. The Lord gives me the ability to fulfill my role to love or to submit. Because why? He's the one that gives me the power to do it because he loves me. He has shown me what it means to submit to one another. And so what I'm saying is the more that I, I can see him and realize as it says here, in the submission or in my love, I'm doing them because God has done it for me and I'm doing it out of love for him. So here's how it works. When you are not respected, right, as a husband, does that mean you choose not to love? What the Bible is teaching is the reason that you love your wife is because you have been loved deeply by God. You don't do it as a condition. Well, I'll love her if she respects me. That, that's not a biblical construct for Christian relationships. You love because God first loved you. And what does it mean to love here? It means to put the wife's best interest, even if it comes at the greatest cost to himself and his aspirations. It is meaning I will choose to put your interest above my own. And in doing so, I will fulfill my role to love you. And that is fulfilling God's demand of me as a human, is to put your interest above my own. And here's the thing, 
If you choose not to respect me, that's okay, I'm still gonna do it. You're still gonna get loved in your interest above my own, whether you respect me or not. That's the Christian example. Now you flip it. Because we're both created equal in God's sight, there is no, the male is higher than the female, the female is higher than the male. He's both created us human. We both have his image on us, male and female. We have different roles. When it says here, submit to your husband, as is fitting in the Lord. Submitting, listening deeply, thinking through the implications. My respect should not be contingent on love because I have been loved by God. Now, when I, I gotta draw a line here because I didn't do this last night. There's a difference of what he's saying is this. It's fitting in the Lord. Fitting in the Lord means that the husband is not acting in sin or rebellion or committing a crime. That, that's not what he's talking about here. That, that, that type of stuff Abuse in that, in that level is, is wrong and sinful and God says is horrible and it should not happen. What he's saying is, he's just talking about the aspect of working together in a relationship. That, that fulfilling both of these roles, there becomes a bond, a union, there becomes a peace that happens. He's not talking about abuse because it has to be fitting in the Lord and the Lord does not want that for his people. And here's the, here's the incredible story behind this, what Paul is writing. What Paul wrote about a husband and a wife's responsibility was a revolutionary concept when he wrote it. And it still is. Here's why. Both under Jewish and Greek laws and customs, all the privileges belong to the husband and all the duties to the wife. But here in Christianity, we have the first time an ethic of mutual and reciprocal obligation. In Greek thinking, the wife just stayed at home, she did her thing, the husband was free to have any relationship with any other person he wanted to have. He wasn't bound to stay in there, and here's what Paul is saying, you can't do that anymore. You can't live like your culture's telling you to live. Not only is that not wrong, you are ignoring Christ in your relationship. He is calling out both the Jewish idea and the Christian idea and says, listen, you just can't divorce her for any old reason you want to divorce her. She is not an object. She's made in God's image and God holds both of you responsible equally. What God is doing here is he's or is redefining relationships as they both have to have Christ as part of them and they all circle around each other. The next one. Children and parents. He says here, children are to obey their parents. Why? Because it pleases the parents. What if your parents are knuckleheads? What if your parents don't listen? What if a lot of the frustration you have growing up and the pain that you've, is coming from your parents? How do I honor someone that I might not respect how do I live and honor someone that doesn't deserve it? I mean, and honestly, there's a good percentage of you probably here that think that way. I would say even more is the majority, and then the lesser, I had great parents, I learned a lot from them, it was a great relationship, I felt both discipline and encouragement equal. I'm gonna say that's the minority view. The majority view is there has been marks in my life that have affected relationships because of those experiences. I can relate more with Martin Luther than I cannot relate with him. And here's what he's saying. The power to honor them is to realize that God is pleased with it. What does that mean for you? Your ability to honor them is because God is pleased with you. God accepts you. God says, I love you. I'm encouraging you. I'm bringing you into myself. And when you do this, man, my heart is so full. You are fulfilling what I've called you to do. Man, I just, I really love you so much. You please me. I love you on your best day or your worst day. I don't hold that against you. I'm gonna love you and discipline you, 
but I'm also going to come there beside you and show you how to fulfill the life I've called you to live. And what happens is, because my relationship with Christ grows in that respect, what happens? I can honor based upon their ability or what I perceived had happened, reality or not, feeling dishonored by them. What, what I'm saying is that the Christian ethic in relationships is incredibly powerful. Because what he does, what Paul does, he calls people to the carpet. Well, another thing that Paul does here, in Roman time, the father had absolute power over his family. He could execute his child if he wanted to. He could. He could take the child when it was presented to him at, at, at the birth and say, nah, I don't want it. And they would take the child and put him in the temple and they, the child would, would more than likely become a prostitute or a slave. What I'm saying is this, is that what Paul is saying is this, fathers, you are not to embitter your child. The, the word here to embitter means to arouse, usually in a bad sense, or to provoke. Paul re reversed to the constant nagging, nagging or belittling of a child. And he goes, that is not your job. You are not this Roman authority that you can do with your child what you will. Actually, you have a command from God to encourage that child, to discipline that child, to love that child. And why would you do that, fathers? Because you have been loved by me. A lot can change in our life, in our children's lives. A lot can change when we realize that God is a part of our relationships. It's just not you and them. There's a, there's a community there. And we realize when I honor my parents when they don't deserve it, really what I'm doing is I'm pleasing God. And the reason I'm pleasing God is because he is well pleased with me. The last one that he talks about here is masters and slaves. Now, if you have an ESV Bible, it will translate it bond servants. And in Ephesians, I talked quite a bit of time. Um, I talked a lot about what's happening in the, in the social context here of slavery in the first century. What would happen here in this context, Rome was a powerful force. Rome would conquer a lot of people, a lot of property, a lot of land. It was a little different back then. When they would go to conquer an area, not like today, when they would go to conquer an area, in some parts of the world they do this, they would go, they would take the people that they would capture, so different people from different ethnic groups, from different backgrounds, they would take their wealth and their people, they would bring them back into Rome, and they would be property of the Roman government. So this revolution, industrial revolution, pre-industrial revolution that kind of launched out in Rome, building all these roads and these buildings and this infrastructure came from its power to capitalize on people and their wealth, right? Rome wasn't in the habit of just killing people to kill people because that's not how you get taxes. They were interested. You go out, work your job. We don't like what you're doing. We'll beat you down. But what we want you to do is we want you to accomplish our goal, which is to make Rome great. That's what we really care about. And so what had happened at this time, there was, as Barclay would argue, there was millions and millions of these people, these workers, these slaves. They were all different ethnic groups, backgrounds, different customs. They were from all over the world. And what Paul says is, the industry of Rome was driven by this group of people. He says here, you have a responsibility to obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. If you look at every example, he says, you submit, as a child you obey, as a slave here you obey, for, for whose pleasure? Christ's pleasure because he's the only master, parent, husband who will love each and every one of you completely. And so what he says here, the reason that you're to do your work, you're doing your work for reverence for who God is, 
his personal name, Yahweh. You're doing it for him. At the same time, as you do this for him, realize that I will hold the masters responsible in how they treat you. What I will do is I'm going to hold them that they are to be right and fair, as chapter 4, verse 1 says. Because you know you have a master in heaven. One of the beautiful things about this text here is there's a promise here in the midst of these relationships. And Paul realizes that relationships are not only messy, that masters will be unfair and unjust, that parents will be harsh with their children and not love them the way they should through discipline and encouragement, that husbands will not love their wives and wives will not submit. So you you have this whole paradigm, Paul understands that. And what he does is he gives a promise and a hope for us in our relationships. Look at what he says here. Verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. With this last group of relationships, he says this. Under Roman law, a slave could not possess any property whatsoever. And and there was nothing promised less than this inheritance that he had. What he's saying is this. I realize that the tension of relationships, the fracturedness, the brokenness that you bear, you have to live under, or that you are dealing with, I know, I know it's difficult, but let me tell you about two things about God and what he's like. He says that God is going to give us an inheritance. Or he says it, it is a, as a reward. What's the reward for? Why do we deserve an inheritance? He says God is looking down at all the brokenness in the world. And he goes, you might be in a position where you might not ever feel loved in a great marriage or in an employment situation where it's fair. And he says here, realize that your reward is not on this side. Knowing me and me part of that relationship, I see all the things going on and there is a reward for you. There is an inheritance for you that you might not ever experience in this life. Success is not me accomplishing that reward, that retirement, that perfect relationship. Yes, I'm gonna strive, yes, I'm gonna go, but it's a reciprocal relationship. Both parties have to work together. But he goes, hey, I'm not counting your failures as a bad parent, as a bad husband, a bad wife. You need to repent of those. You need to come to me you need, to, you need to ask me to forgive you. We need to work through these things. But there's a reward for you. And, it's, and it, this reward is this inheritance. And what is that? That you will be with him one day. That you can call him your father knowing that he loves you. You can be his child and obey him knowing that he loves you. That he is the husband. He is the one who will care and provide. Because you know he loves you. That he is the only master who will always treat you fair and always do what's right. The story of Christianity is a story of hope that one day we'll be with him and then we'll realize the perfection of all these things. The last thing he says, and the second thing that we can, is this, verse 25. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs and there is no favoritism. And this might give you a little help in the context that you're in. You're like, Ryan, I really can't engage in this relationship. You, you don't, don't understand how bad my dad was or how bad my mom was. You, you don't know what happened. Uh, and I, you know what? I probably won't be able to relate with it. 
probably won't be able to understand the depth of pain in that. But what I do know, and the only thing I can encourage you is this, anyone who does wrong will be repaid. Man, I'm telling you at the end, when God deals with our hearts and the sin that we've distorted in our relationships by not loving and not cherishing and not submitting, not all these things, hey, God's gonna deal with all that. I have no power to deal with that on this life. And I look at things, wow, that's pretty unfair. That's really wrong. Man, God, how, why is that happening? And what he says to me, as I look here, he goes, listen, Ryan, though, whoever does wrong will be repaid. And I'm telling you, there is no favoritism with him. So the encouragement that I can have to live this life is realizing that even in the distortion of really bad relationships, Man, God wants to give you power to be able to live the relationships you have now. He wants to give you power to be able to, in a marriage, to be able to love and to submit, realizing that you're doing it out of Christ love. He's empowering you to love, which because of your feeling that love, you're able to love your wife. He's empowering the wife to, to submit so she can submit. And in that respect, there can be a mutual sharing in that relationship. He's talking about fathers and children. He says, children, I'm gonna empower, I'm gonna give you a power to honor and to obey your parents. I'm gonna give you a power to do that. You know why? Because as a father to you, I love you, right? And I've honored my father, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. And then for the fathers, what he's gonna do is I'm gonna show you what it means to love your children even though they're disrespectful and they don't love you back. Then he talks about in workplace, hey, I'm going to show you what it means to obey. He goes, you know what I did? I suffered to the point of death. And you know why I did that? I believe something about my father, Jesus said. He loves me to the very end, that he's going to be with me. And I know he's good. So I'm willing to give up to love him and to show him how much I love him. And then he's going to say, hey, to masters, to rulers, to bosses, Listen, you have a responsibility to treat your employees fair and right. I, I, I don't like this phrase. I've heard it a lot. It's this phrase this, business is just business. So if I understand that right, and this is not to be jaded, it's okay to stab, beat down, hurt other people for the sake of personal gain. I don't know if that f- is what he's saying in here of what right and fair is. So all I'm saying is, Do not, do not say, well, this relationship over here, this is something that's private and it doesn't matter because God will not allow you to do that. Those relationships that you have with employees and bosses, your work, your family, and your marriage, he goes, Christ better be in them because he is there. And if he's not, he's going to issue a verdict about it. What we are commanded to do is to press into these things. When you don't feel loved or accepted, when you don't feel that it's fair or right, you call out to him. He sees all the injustice. You make the right course of action in your life. You do what's right to honor him and realize that he's there in your midst, empowering you, strengthening you, giving you the ability to to work together in a relationship. Maybe you're at a crossroads in this marriage and relationship event will be a great event for you to come out to. Maybe following up with a small group about your marriage to talk about it more deeply with some people, that the counseling will help. But at the end of the day, your ability to press into your marriage becomes your ability to press into that other part of that relationship who's God himself. When God presses into you and shows you the amount of love and care he has for you, I'm telling you, the only thing that you can do outward is to mirror that. When God shows you how much he respects his father and loves his father, the only thing they can push out of that is those things. There's a power in God through the Holy Spirit who empowers us that gives us the ability to do those things. And when we fail, which we will, as soon as I'm done talking, or already, when we fail to do those things, Here's my last encouragement to you. God will forgive you. He will empower you. And you have to come to him. Say, God, I recognize that what I've done is wrong. 
that what I've done is sin against you. I've broken this relationship the way you've created me to live. Will you forgive me? Then you go to that person. Will you forgive me? I've not been fair or right. I've not loved well. I've not honored you. Would you forgive me? There's a power through the Holy Spirit that frees us to be able to do those things. And as we press in, not only into relationships together as a church, but into our own life and the messiness and the pain of those relationships. Listen, it might take, a, take some time and warm up time to get there. But as we encourage one another to do that, I'm, t- I'm telling you, it'll bring change. It'll bring, bring God's love in, in a powerful way into your life like you've never experienced. So what we're gonna do as we close out the service is this. I'm gonna ask the prayer team members to come down forward before we finish. And if you have a need prayer for, for maybe a power and asking God to empower you to work inside of a relationship, I want you to be able to do that. So the prayer team, you guys come on, don't be afraid. Come on, Bruce, I see you. I'm gonna call them out, that's right, that's how it works. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray. And if you'd like to come up and talk to one of these prayer counselors, we'd love for you to do that. We'd love for you to be encouraged. We'd love for you to walk in those. Maybe for you, the struggle with your relationship is that Christ is not even a part of your life, that you don't have a relationship with him. The only way to be able to love your spouse, to love your children, to love your employees in any of those contexts is because Christ is in you. I'd love for you to come up and tell one of the prayer counselors, I don't know who Christ is. I'd love for you to share with me Christ. I want him to be a part of my life to give me the power to do that. I want to feel that forgiveness like he's talking about. So let's pray together. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing and continue to do. Lord, I just pray that you would change our relationships. Lord, that you have wired us to have relationships. God, you desire to have us to have relationships. And Jesus, just explode these relationships with what it means to know you. Lord, I just thank you that you gave us the power to do this through your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for for coming and giving an example of what it means to love and to cherish and to honor. Lord, I I just thank you for that example. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for um, this time together. Jesus, I pray that you would encourage us now. In your name we pray, amen. You guys have a great weekend. We'll see you Wednesday night.